A Boeing 737 vanishes from radar above one of the most remote areas on Earth. It's the worst accident in the history of Panama. A jumbo jet slams into the English countryside. It was like a battlefield. A late night flight in Russia <laughs> ends in a harrowing crash. It's the sole control of the aircraft. And without it, it would be very, very difficult to fly the airplane. When critical instruments cause confusion, the bank's not working. The consequences can be deadly. Look, bank! Suddenly, you find that the aircraft is performing in ways that you didn't expect, and the airplane's out of control. Tocumen International Airport in Panama City. Copa Airlines Flight 201 prepares for a one-hour flight south to Cali, Colombia. V1. Rotate. Gear up. Copa's most senior pilot, Captain Rafael Kiel, is monitoring the instruments. Set thrust to climb. First officer Cesario Tejada is at the controls. Forty passengers are on board, mostly business travelers heading home to Colombia. We've got some heavy weather moving in from the Gulf. Tonight, the pilots won't be able to fly their planned route. Panama Center, Copa 201. We'd like to get around this weather, requesting a new heading for 090. Copa 201, copy that. You're cleared on a heading 090. Cleared, heading 090. The new flight path takes the 737 east, around the storm, before heading south again to Cali. Panama Center, Copa 201. Level at 250. Minutes later, Copa 201 disappears from radar. If you're close to thunderstorms and in a lot of rain, they'll be static on the radio. And sometimes uh, you may not be able to talk them for, for a few minutes. But air traffic control never hears again from Copa 201. The next day, search teams begin the task of locating the plane and any survivors. A mass of wreckage is found in the remote Darien Gap. Panama's Deputy Director of Civil Aviation, Jorge Rodriguez, is under enormous pressure to figure out what happened. At that time, it was the first big accident of air carrier of Panama. We lost 47 people on board, all dead. Investigators begin collecting and cataloging the wreckage. It's spread across an area exceeding a hundred square miles. Tom Hatter, NDSB. How you doing? The United States National Transportation Safety Board is invited to join the investigation. There's a lot of pressure to the NTSB in all investigations to determine the cause of the accident. That's what we do. Uh, so certainly we want to know what happened, why, and we want to prevent another accident. That's our main mission. After a grueling hunt, the search team recovers the black boxes, 
we were hoping with the cockpit voice recorder, we'd get more information in terms of what the crew was saying, what was happening you know, right at the time of impact. But then the technicians opened the cockpit voice recorder. My God, what a mess. You just had a ball of Mylar tape. Fortunately, the flight data recorder is in good condition. The data we had, the takeoff, the climb out, you know, the cruise, everything was, looked like a, a normal flight. Investigators know that COPA 201 diverted to avoid a storm. Did the pilots make an error at that moment? We could go back and look at the weather data and the long range radar data. Flying in weather at night, thunderstorms can be totally disorienting. When the investigators examined the plane's track, they determined the plane did fly out of the storm's path. I say that the weather wasn't an issue in that accident. If not the weather, then what brought down COPA 201? Everything was normal. That was abrupt. Investigators used the last two minutes of flight data to create an animation of the plane's final moments. It should be correcting. It's not correcting. Whoa, what the heck's going on? We would start seeing the aircraft, you know, roll over and to a bank angle, then suddenly snap back to level or vice versa. They need to find an explanation for the plane's erratic maneuvers. The team searches the cockpit controls for clues. One switch's setting raises a red flag. The vertical gyro switch affects the most important flight instrument in the cockpit, the attitude indicator. V1, rotate. Each pilot has their own attitude indicator. It registers how the plane is positioned relative to the horizon. The pilot's attitude indicator is like a, like a ball. It shows bank angle, it shows pitch. Each attitude indicator is connected to a vertical gyro, or VG. The gyros constantly calculate the plane's attitude. Looks like they're having trouble with the first officer's gyro. On this flight, the first officer's attitude indicator was switched over to VG1, the captain's gyro. Both of them were reading data from the same gyro source, which makes you think that at some point, Either it was selected that way, or they didn't realize it was selected that way, but they're both feeding data from the same source, which is unusual. A pilot only switches to the other gyro if there's a problem with their own. If one gyro goes bad, you don't want to have the pilot looking at bad data, so you switch them both over to the good data. COPA 201 was also equipped with a third gyro and attitude indicator, independent of the captains and first officers. Pilots should use the third gyro to clarify which ADI is operating correctly. What caused the pilots to switch over and share the captain's gyro on flight 201? Okay, fired up. What we wanted to look at was, is there anything here that would show us what happened? Is there a failure in the gyro, or maybe the failure is actually an attitude indicator? Well, this one seems to work fine. Nothing is wrong with the first officer's instrument. Let's see the other one. At first, the captain's instrument seems fine, too. Hang on, it seems to be stuck. Every few seconds, the captain's attitude indicator freezes, even though the gyro is still feeding it data. Yeah, there it goes, now it's working. What's causing the intermittent failure? They test every wire connecting the display to the gyro. Oh, no wonder. This wire is hanging by a thread. We found a, a basically a break in the wire. They were intermittent. It was close enough that sometimes it would touch and sometimes it wouldn't. The faulty connection is a major breakthrough in the investigation, but it also poses a challenge. 
The way the airplane is wired is what the captain is seeing on his attitude indicator is what's being recorded on the flight data recorder. The same faulty data being fed to the captain's attitude indicator was being sent to the flight recorder. OK, let's see what the plane was really doing. But by carefully analyzing other parameters on the flight data recorder, they managed to calculate its actual movements and reveal the plane's true motion. Making a visual of it where you could see what the data is showing and what the airplane's doing, that, that visual is extraordinarily helpful. The red image reflects the bad data the pilots were seeing, while the solid image shows how COPA 201 was actually flying. They're trying to level the plane, but they're making it worse. You have the attitude indicator here stuck. Now, but the airplanes go in the other direction. And then suddenly, the attitude indicator gets power to it, unsticks. It goes back and mimics the airplane again. Go right. You need to go right. I am. What's it doing? He doesn't realize that all he's doing is making a problem worse. He's looking at an instrument providing bad data, and then he lost control of the aircraft. If this had been a daytime flight, the pilots would have had the horizon to guide them. But flying at night, they had to rely solely on their instruments. The FDR data reveals that the plane rolls so far to the right that recovery is impossible. Once I got to this point, they didn't have a chance. But investigators are puzzled. It was the captain's gyro that failed in flight and started sending bad data. So why was it selected? So the question is, why they believed the captain's gyro was the good one? Why was it switched to that position? On COPA 201, the captain's attitude indicator malfunctioned. So why was the crew relying on it instead of the first officers, which was functioning perfectly? Trying to understand the flight crew's confusion. OK, let's start. Investigators work with the same type of flight simulator used by the COPA crew for their 737 training. Climb to 25,000 and turn right. They recreate the flight of COPA 201. Now, trigger the failure including the malfunction of the captain's attitude indicator. Now, how'd you make the switch? Wait a minute, let me see that. That is not the same switch that was on COPA 201. Two different configurations of one small control switch has overwhelming implications. This is the gyro switch from the simulator where the captain was trained. Next slide, please. And this is the gyro switch from COPA 201. Now, can we get a close-up, please? All right, now let's see both. Wow, that's completely different. The cockpits of the simulator were dissimilar, and so it was possible to get confused thinking you were going to independent gyro source when you weren't. In the simulator, flipping the toggle to the left switches the captain's instrument to the third gyro, which is independent of the other two. But on flight 201, flipping the switch to the left put both instruments on the captain's system, which was malfunctioning. Panama Center, COPA 201. Investigators finally have a theory of how the flight went so horribly wrong. It looks like we're going to have to take the long way around. Mm -hmm. After diverting around the storm, the crew of COPA Flight 201 needs to turn right to get back on course. Turning right, heading 160. Well clear of the storm now. Mm -hmm. As the plane levels out, an error flag warns of a problem with the captain's attitude indicator. They flip the gyro switch to the left, thinking they're now using a backup gyro. Now they're both on the bad gyro, and neither of them knows about it. 
That's weird. Why won't he level? In the middle of the night, you don't have the horizon. You lose the horizon, you don't know where you are. First Officer Tejada turns his wheel to level the wings. His frozen instrument makes it appear the plane isn't responding, so he continues to turn, sending the plane further and further to the left. He's trying to correct a problem he's seen on his instrument. He's taught to you know, follow your instruments, believe in the instruments. He's actually making the problem a lot worse. Go right, you need to go right. I am. What's it doing? Now he sees a left bank, so he's trying to correct it by banking right. Altitude! In God's name! Pull up! Pull up! By the time the pilots realize they're in a dive... Oh my God! Left! 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 I'm trying, Captain! It's too late. It'd be extraordinarily disconcerting. You've gone from a few degrees to the left to multiple degrees to the right. It was like, what's happening here? Confused by their instruments, the pilots lose control. In the accident's aftermath, COPA revamps pilot training to ensure that crews are better prepared for an instrument malfunction. One of the improvements we've made in it as an industry is better pilot training and also the improvement in the flight instruments so that they're no longer mechanical. They're typically ring laser gyro. They're more electronic so that you don't have the failures um, that you used to. Forty miles northeast of London, Stansted Airport is a major European hub. Korean Air Flight 8509 is preparing to take off to Milan, Italy. The aircraft was a Boeing 747 freighter. As the name suggests, it was not configured with passenger seats, but uh, uh, the interior was full up with freight. Captain Park duck Q is a highly respected commander. Sir. He's a former colonel in the Korean Air Force with thousands of hours of flying time on the 747. Park Hun Q is Flight 8509's flight engineer responsible for monitoring the aircraft's mechanical systems. First Officer Yoon Ki Sik has only 195 hours flying time on the 747. On this night, there were the three crew and a Korean engineer. The engineer has overseen some minor maintenance work on the aircraft and will now accompany Flight 8509 back to Seoul. All right, gentlemen, let's proceed. Eighty knots. Roger. V1. Rotate. The plane lifts off from Stansted Airport at 6.36 p.m. Positive rate confirmed. You're up. You're up. At 2,500 feet, the aircraft needs to make a left turn. Left turn at 1.5 DME. But the captain's attitude indicator registers that the plane isn't responding. Bank! Bank! The flight engineer recognizes the plane is banking. Look! Bank! In less than 60 seconds, for some unexplained reason, Korean Air Flight 8509 has gone from takeoff to catastrophe. Korean Air Flight 8509 lies in pieces just a few miles from one of the world's busiest airports. The UK's Air Accidents Investigation Branch deploys a team to the site. 
It was a very confusing debris field. It takes a while uh, for, for one to absorb the scene and uh, to try and make sense of it all. By daylight, they get their first good look at the point of impact. A massive crater surrounded on all sides by debris. Investigators get a glimpse into the flight's final seconds from a portion of the ground scar. It was a, a long, slender gash, which was made by the wing, and then you could see where the nose had impacted further on. This suggests the plane hit the ground on its side, but not according to the captain's attitude direction indicator. It shows the plane was flying level at the time of impact. Did the ADI malfunction? Seeking answers, investigators interview the crew that flew the previous leg of the flight from Uzbekistan to Stansted. I need you to walk me through exactly what happened. They told us that when they departed from Tashkent the day before, in good weather, in daylight conditions, they had to carry out a turn to the left. As the captain commenced the turn, his artificial horizon did not work in roll. By daylight, the pilot was able to get his bearings from the horizon. After landing, the inbound crew left the terminal before the replacement crew arrived. The only person who heard about the problem with the attitude indicator was the Korean air maintenance engineer. He then enlisted a local mechanic to help. I need you to remove the captain's ADI. The locally based engineer told us he removed the instrument from the panel, unplugged the wires at the back. All right, that's our problem. Can you reset the pin? And found what he believed to be a, a problem with the connector pins at the back of the instrument. Looks good. The engineer assumes the attitude indicator was repaired. But when investigators examine data from the flight recorders, something doesn't add up. The readout is showing that the plane's roll angle never exceeded two degrees. That's insufficient to cause the plane to go out of control. Clearly it had gone in. Uh, at a much steeper roll angle than that, like 90 degrees. So that set the alarm bells ringing. Why should that occur? It turns out the problem with the attitude indicator was not properly diagnosed. When investigators dig deeper into the navigation system, they discover that one of the plane's gyros had short-circuited. This was the gyro feeding the captain's attitude indicator. It simply ended up in corrupting the, the, the role information that was fed to the, both the flight data recorder and the captain's ADI. The rectification action was completely ineffective. The aircraft took off with the same defect that it had arrived with. The pilots on Korean Air faced the same problem that took down COPA 201, one malfunctioning ADI. In this case, the flight data shows that both the first officer's attitude indicator and the backup instrument displayed the plane's true bank angle. Only the captain's indicator was malfunctioning. An instrument failure is a, is a rare occurrence. However, crews are trained to deal with it. Why didn't the crew alert the captain that his instrument was faulty and that they were potentially heading for disaster? Were they all confused by their instruments? AAIB technicians salvage the recording from Flight 8509's badly damaged cockpit voice recorder. One of the most important things that was on that recorder was the sound of a warning horn going off in the cockpit as the aircraft departed from Stansted. But even more significant than the sound of the alarm 
is the absence of any reaction to it. They seem to be ignoring the alarms completely. The co-pilot should have said to the captain, your ADI is not reading correctly. It was obvious from this accident that the crew interaction played a big part in this accident. A lot of the captains in Korean Air were people that had developed their skills in the military. Captain Park was a colonel and fighter pilot with a distinguished military career. There was definitely a hierarchy between pilots. When the younger, less experienced first officer noticed the discrepancy in the ADIs, he didn't dare correct his captain's actions. This crew were not operating as a crew. They were operating as one man with a couple of assistants. Bank! Bank! The captain wrongly believed what his malfunctioning ADI was telling him. Look! Bank! The aircraft just continued to roll. 30 degrees, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 degrees of bank. The AAIB recommends changes to Korean air pilot training. In response, the airline overhauls its training programs, recommending that crews work together more closely. When problems happen with the attitude indication systems, the actions pilots take can eventually put the aircraft into a position where it can't recover, but it's not something that's immediate. That is, if the crew takes the time to diagnose or recognize the problem and take the appropriate action, there's usually plenty of time to correct this and continue flying safely. Aeroflot Nord Flight 821 is moments from touching down in Perm, a city in central Russia. There are 82 passengers on board the Boeing 737. 43-year-old First Officer Rustem Alaberdin is the pilot flying tonight. The captain, Rodion Medvedev, 34, is monitoring the instruments and radio communications. They are making the two-hour journey from Moscow to Perm and will then return to the Russian capital. It will descend to 2,000 feet. Surface wind 050 degrees out, 10 knots. The wind is 9 knots. Increase your speed. Right, of course. 891, 821. Confirming base turn and descending to 2,000 feet. The crew prepares for landing. Flaps 30. Set. But in the tower, the controller sees that flight 821 is climbing instead of descending. Aeroflot 821, according to my data, you are climbing. Can you confirm? Damn it. To resume the descent, the first officer adjusts the pitch of the plane. We can confirm and we're descending now. But now the controller sees Flight 821 flying past the approach path to the runway. He instructs the crew to loop around and try again. Aeroflot Nord 821, restart your final approach. Turn right, heading 360, descend to 2,000 feet. But this instruction is ignored. A21, descend to 2,000 feet. Turn right, heading 360. Follow my instructions strictly. What the flight controller doesn't know is that the pilots have lost control of the plane. No way! Other direction!
Flight A21 has crashed on the outskirts of Perm. Everyone on board has died. How did this landing turn into a fatal disaster? Aeroflot Nord Flight A21 has crashed on the outskirts of Perm, Russia. All 88 people on board are dead. Be careful with us. Bring them over here. Russian investigators from the Interstate Aviation Committee, the IAC, are called in to find the cause of this tragic accident. Their American counterparts from the National Transportation Safety Board join the team. Thank you. We're making trip from Washington. I hope we can help. We were invited because the Boeing was a, a manufactured in the United States. What about the uh, flight recorders? They're in rough shape. The cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder are badly damaged. They are sent to a facility in France that specializes in retrieving data, but it could take weeks for the results to return. In the meantime, investigators need to find out if all of the 737's flight systems were in working order after taking off from Moscow. Maintenance records reveal that a month before the crash, the right engine started producing 20% more thrust than the left. And that's enough to throw the engine balance way off. A Boeing 737's engines are spaced apart beneath the wings. When the thrust is uneven, the stronger side pushes the wing up, causing the airplane to roll. Pilots need to compensate for this uneven thrust. The only way it can counteract an asymmetric thrust is to provide bank, a small amount of bank, in the opposite direction to try and maintain the aircraft's track. The imbalance was so extreme that the 737's previous pilots photographed the thrust levers to show the degree of stagger required to level the plane. It's a crucial lead. A split in engine balance makes it more difficult to fly, but it shouldn't cause a crash. But did these pilots know about the mismatch? Take a look. The crash day, and it's signed by now, Captain. The pilots did know about the need for staggered throttles. But were they able to fly the plane like this? The airline assist both pilots was very experienced. Captain had over 3,900 flying hours. 1,400 of this at night. Wait, two-thirds of his hours were in the cockpit of the Tupolev 134. The 2134. Built in Russia, the Tupolev 134 was one of the most widely used jets in the former Soviet bloc. Unlike the 737, its engines are positioned side by side at the rear of the plane and require minimal adjustment if they're mismatched. Flying the 737, it's very different from flying the Tupolev. With this discovery, investigators now consider how qualified the pilots were to fly the 737. They delve into the captain's training records. The captain's English language skills were limited, which begs the question, how much training did he understand? All the technical manuals were written in English, and all their operating procedures were written in English. And Medvedev got his training certification for the 737 on September 10, 2006, but then went back to flying the Tupolev. He didn't get into the 737 again until January 9, 2007. He got a four-month break away from his knowledge, and he had to have been forgetting things left and right. Hardly a proficient 737 pilot. Hardly. The first officer's record is carefully examined. I am from IAC. I have a quick question for you. And in particular, his 737 training. He had plenty of experience on Antonov II. The Antonov II is a huge propeller biplane with a single engine. But it's a much simpler plane to fly than the Boeing 737. 737 simulator proved to be a real challenge for him. 
One thing the first officer struggled with was flying with thrust asymmetry. Check the speed you are banking. Bank angle. Bank angle. You're banking. Bank angle. Bank <laughs> this angle. is the third time. Bank angle. It appears both pilots were ill-equipped to fly the 737, especially when facing the challenge of an uneven thrust. Medvedev was simply too green to captain the 737. We can't tell how much of the English training he even retained. First officer had even more failings. It was a mistake to put them together in the cockpit. The investigators now know that two inexperienced pilots were paired in the cockpit. What they still don't know is how they sent Flight 821 into a deadly spiral. Specialists in France have finally extracted the data from the badly damaged flight recorder of Aeroflot Nord 821. OK. Now we can see what the plane was doing. Let's pull up the parameters. The first few hours of data provide few clues as to the cause of the crash. It looks like the auto throttle is on. It's staggering the thrust levers and matching the engines. But in the last three minutes of the flight, the situation changes dramatically. The right engine is operating at nearly 61%, but the left is closer to 40. The auto throttle, unable to handle such a large disparity in engine power, disengages. The first officer now has to manage a massive imbalance in thrust, something he couldn't master in training. It required a lot more flying skill. You had to compensate for the uh, fact that the engine power was mismatched, or you had to very carefully move the throttles in a way that kept the power balanced. And the crew wasn't very good at doing either one of those things. What the FDR shows next is more troubling. As the first officer begins the right turn towards the runway, he turns the control column right, pushes it forward, and engages the stabilizer trim, a sequence of actions that now turns off the autopilot. In most instances, an autopilot is somewhat uh, difficult to disengage. But this man managed to do that by, by accidentally trimming when he should not have. Then something even more disturbing comes to light. Take a look at that. No one has an input for 20, 25 seconds. With the autopilot off, neither pilot adjusts throttle, pitch, or roll for 25 seconds. There is nothing controlling the plane. The mismatched engines are allowed to continue banking the plane dangerously to the left. Let's hear now what's going on on that plane. Investigators now turn to the cockpit voice recorder. 821, is everything OK with the crew? Aeroflot 821, affirmative. Take it! Take it! The first officer doesn't know why they're banking. He wants captain to take over. Keep going. Take it! Take it! Take what? I can't do it either. Despite his resistance, the captain grabs the controls, but instead of leveling the plane, he banks further left, putting the plane into the diving roll. Oh, wrong way, other direction. Bank angle. Bank What's angle. Going on? He needs to bank right, but he's banking left instead. He's confused. With the flight in crisis, it's crucial the captain checks his ADI and understands what it's telling him. But there is reason to suspect he's confused and not reading it correctly. In the Western ADI, the airplane symbol remains fixed, aligned with the actual airplane. So as you bank the aircraft, the horizon will tilt to show the same view as you would see if you looked out the window. The ADI in older planes from Soviet bloc countries worked just the opposite. The horizon is fixed and the airplane symbol moves. It's a huge difference. Captain was suddenly given control of the aircraft 
I think he uh, looked down and didn't realize the situation and started to bank it hard to the left. He may have reverted back to interpreting the instruments he was used to when he was flying the Tupolev or the Antonov. The captain didn't know which way he was really banking. Exactly, and he made the bad situation worse. And it turns out there's something else contributing to the captain's poor performance. Right before takeoff, a passenger sent a text to a friend. She thought Captain was drunk. Tests on the captain's remains confirm the worst. He was drunk. That could explain why the captain resisted taking control. Take it! Take it! Take what? I can't do it either! And then misread his ADI. The commander had raised levels of alcohol, which impaired his judgment and his ability to react accordingly in a stressful situation. What's going on? Yeah. In the final report, the investigative team recommends a significant overhaul of the Russian aviation system. The whole system needed to be looked at and strengthened in terms of the regulations and how they train Russian pilots. When pilots misread their instruments, routine flights turn deadly. The aviation industry has responded with better training to prevent confusion in the cockpit. These are lessons learned which become part of future training, lessons learned or insights that become catalysts for change within an organization. It's something that becomes part of the DNA of aviation. Mm -hmm.